Good. So uh, well, welcome back. Uh, so just to um, uh, briefly recap uh, where we left off uh, yesterday afternoon. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, so we defined the circuit complexity of a unitary transformation acting on n qubits or of an n qubit quantum state uh, as basically just the minimum number of elementary uh, one or two qubit unitary operations that are needed in any uh, circuit to apply that unitary or to prepare that state. Uh, and um, uh, so we also uh, 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 briefly discussed some of the basic uh, structure of uh, uh, complexity classes of, of computational problems, like uh, P and BPP, which are the efficiently solvable decision problems using a classical computer, uh, BQP, the efficiently solvable problems uh, on a quantum computer, uh, NP, which is the efficiently verifiable problems, uh, setting the stage for the famous P versus NP problem, and then slightly below NP, the problem of uh, inverting uh, a one-way function whose uh, presumed hardness is the basis for cryptography. Uh, and then um, PP, uh, for you know, problems where a randomized algorithm can guess the right answer uh, with better than even odds. Uh, P space, everything doable with a polynomial amount of memory uh, on a classical computer or on a quantum computer. It, it turns out that, that those two are equivalent when you look at memory. Okay, uh, exp, what you can do with a classical computer with an exponential amount of time. And then uh, each of these classes ha has a so-called non-uniform version uh, where you could allow a different algorithm for each uh, input length. And you denote that with this notation slash poly, which means just with polynomial size advice. So that's just a technical point. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, you know, we seem uh, very far today from being able to prove that P is not equal to NP, or for that matter, even P is not equal to P space. Okay, so stepping back, you know, how do we argue uh, in computer science that problems are hard? I mean, you know, what do we do all day to justify our paychecks? Uh, I mean, other than uh, inventing fast algorithms, which, you know, uh, when, 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 when they exist, you might say, uh, are uh, uh, certainly an obstruction to uh, impossibility results. Okay? So, um, uh, well, one of the main things that we know how to do is to give so-called reduction arguments. Okay? So, um, where did I put this? Here we go. Uh, so given any uh, computational problem B, okay, uh, if we write like some uh, model of computation like polynomial time or P with a superscript of B, uh, what we mean by that is P with a, an oracle for solving the problem B for free. Okay, so we imagine a polynomial time algorithm that whenever it wants to can just uh, take an arbitrary instance of problem B, you know, which might be uh, factoring or satisfiability, simulating quantum mechanics, whatever it is, and just solve it in no more time than is needed to write the problem instance down. Okay, that, that's what Oracle means. Uh, the term goes back to Alan Turing, actually in a PhD thesis that he wrote in 1939, uh, right before he uh, went to break the uh, Nazis' Enigma code. Okay, but I think oracles are important too. Uh, so uh, so a, 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 as an example, if you've heard of the famous NP-complete problems, those are simply the pro those problems that are in NP uh, and um, such that uh, um, NP, all NP problems are solvable in polynomial time with a B oracle. Okay? So in other words, they are the maximally hard problems in the class NP. Okay? That's what NP complete means. Uh, and more generally, the concept of oracle lets us define a notion of reducibility between computational problems. Okay, we could say that problem A is polynomial time reducible to problem B if and only if A is solvable in polynomial time given an oracle for B. 
right? Or in other words, the ability to solve problem B, if you had it, would make problem A easy. Okay, so this is a notion that gives order to what would otherwise look like just a huge jungle of random problems. Okay, uh, you can easily check that this is a partial order relation, you know, on, uh, on problems. Okay, and, um, and, so, and so very often, you know, this is the type of thing we're able to do, to, you know, relate problems to each other and to say, well, you know, I can't prove unconditionally that this problem is hard, but I can pass the blame to someone else. Okay, that, uh, you know, if, if, if you could solve it, then you could also solve 10,000 other things that have uh, resisted efficient algorithms for uh, half a century. Okay, so indeed, you know, a very, very common type of theorem in cryptography to say, well, you know, we can't prove unconditionally that our crypto systems are secure. That would require proving P not equal to NP uh, at a minimum. But often what, what one can do with enough effort is one can start from a one-way function it's a very simple, well understood object, and then build out of it some very complicated cryptographic protocol. And then one can prove a theorem saying that any polynomial time algorithm to break this protocol, you know, by any means, must imply an efficient algorithm to invert the underlying one way function. Right, so, so one, can, uh, uh, one can often do this kind of reduction, which is, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, a pretty good uh, security assurance when you, can get, when you can get it relative to our current state of knowledge. Okay, good. So, uh, so now, as I uh, mentioned yesterday, what Harlow and Hayden did uh, in 2013 was precisely to apply this reduction paradigm to the problem of decoding the Hawking radiation coming out of a black hole, you know, and thereby activating the firewall paradox. Okay, so uh, just to review, the Harlow-Hayden decoding problem said we're given uh, a description of a quantum circuit C that maps some simple initial state of infalling matter to a pure state psi RBH uh, of uh, three regions uh, um, you know, uh, of uh, uh, Hawking radiation uh, and uh, sort of a, a, a mode that's just coming out of the black hole, B and H, which is still inside the black hole. Uh, the task is to apply some unitary transformation, U or U sub R, to, to the R region only uh, in order to put a designated qubit of R into a bell pair, uh, you know, 0, 0 plus 1, 1 uh, with B, okay? Thereby uh, showing that, that actually this Hawking radiation was not in a completely thermal state. You know, there was entanglement there and then, you know, activating the whole rest of the uh, AMPS argument that, that Ahmed uh, uh, walked you through. Uh, just to uh, answer a question that came up uh, uh, yesterday. Okay, so, so I'll, I'll simply say, you know, you, uh, uh, you're, you're, you are promised that there is entanglement there to be found. You know, that, 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 that this task is possible. Okay, but is that a reasonable assumption? Well, we mentioned that, you know, uh, there would be entanglement if psi were a hard random state. Right? But of course, psi is not a Haar random state. It can't be because it is produced by a polynomial size quantum circuit. Right? And a polynomial size quantum circuit just doesn't have nearly enough degrees of freedom in it to you know, fully explore the Hilbert space. Okay, nevertheless, one can show that you know, if uh, we took the ansatz that C was a random circuit of polynomial size, so a sort of scrambling circuit, so to speak, then uh, psi will behave in many respects as if it were a hard random state. Okay, and in particular, with overwhelming probability, one can show that yes, there will be this entanglement. Uh, I give that as an exercise, yeah. Oh, well, uh, basically because of this uh, uh, polynomial time uh, church touring thesis that I mentioned yesterday. In other words, the uh, background assumption here is that all of nature is, should be efficiently simulatable by a quantum computer. Okay, now, you know, that may seem like a bold assumption, uh, it is, uh, but, you know, in this circumstance, I think it's perfectly justified because if it were not the case, then presumably our problem would only be harder. Right? You know, we're trying to argue that something is hard here. Okay? 
So you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm granting you that you know, the laws of physics can be easily simulated with a quantum computer. And nevertheless, we want to argue that the Harlow-Hayden decoding task is hard. OK, good. So, um, uh, so now notice, no, that is not what I wanted. Okay. Notice that um, if we were able to act on all three registers, R, B, and H, then we could simply apply C dagger and return our whole state to the all zero state, right? We could just reverse everything that had happened and in effect uh, decode whatever we wanted. Okay, but we don't have access to the whole state, okay? Because you know, the H part is still inside the black hole. Okay, so uh, what we have is that by acting only on R, it is information theoretically possible to uh, decode uh, the entanglement, but we want to argue that it is computationally intractable. Okay, so, um, uh, uh, so, so in other words, um, you know, for an astrophysical mass black hole, we'd like to argue that uh, you know, this cannot be done in, uh, by Alice, say, in a mere 10 to the 70th years, but will instead take on the order of 2 to the 10 to the 70th years. Okay, so the black hole would have long ago evaporated before Alice had even made a dent in the problem. Uh, now, I know Ahmed already discussed this, but stepping back, you might ask, you know, what is the point of arguing this, right? I mean, isn't the hardness of, you know, creating the firewall merely a technological issue? You know, or are we literally saying that a contradiction in the laws of physics would be okay if it took exponential time to uncover the contradiction? Uh, well, um, I think, uh, no, uh, we're, uh, we're not saying that. Or at least Harlow and Hayden weren't, and, and I'm not either. Uh, I mean, presumably, the laws of physics, uh, whatever they are, are free of contradiction. Uh, if they weren't, then our universe couldn't exist, being a model of those laws. Okay? Uh, so the real question, you might say, is simply, uh, how hard uh, would Alice need to work in order to observe a breakdown of effective field theory as she crosses the event horizon? Okay, now we already know that the answer to that question is something short of infinitely hard, right? So for example, you know, if Alice were able to do probes at the Planck energy, uh, well then, you know, we know that effective field theory would break down and she would need a quantum theory of gravity to fully describe her experiences. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, you know, we're using that that has a horizon so that, you know, a part of it is inaccessible to us. Uh, we are sort of mildly using the assumption that it scrambles states up, you know, in order to uh, uh, get that there is the entanglement here. Um, you know, I think that those are the main properties being used. You know, you know other than that, you know, much of it might apply to a lump of coal as well. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to that uh, in, in, in just a second, okay? Okay, so, um, so yeah, so, so what, what Harlow and Hayden said, uh, just to uh, uh, back up, which was novel and interesting to me, uh, is that there might be a completely different limit uh, where effective field theory breaks down uh, than the high energy limit, namely the limit of exponential computational hardness. Okay, if so, then we would have a sort of computational cosmic censorship, right? Or, you know, the geometry of space time would be protected by this uh, armor of complexity, which, you know, if true, seems worth knowing about. Okay, now, it is true that as Oppenheim and Unruh pointed out, uh, you know, if you were to invest exponential pre-computation time, you know, to, to set things up, then you could engineer an incredibly special black hole, uh, which would be entangled with some reference system outside the black hole. And then because of the entanglement with the reference system, the Harlow-Hayden argu hardness argument would, would not apply. Okay, but um, even if so, you know, I think you, know, you might still be very reassured that firewalls are a non-issue for any black hole that you'll ever encounter in the wild, 
right? I mean, in effect, you're saying that, you know, uh, in order to get a firewall, well, you still have to invest exponential computation time. It's simply that uh, in the Oppenheim and Unrest setup, you need to do it up front before you even create the black hole. Okay, so, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, if, if you were willing to invest that time, I mean, you know, I'm, uh, uh, you know, it, I mean, well, it's sort of a, a um, you know, outside of my purview, but I have no intuition that says, you know, uh, that, that, that you shouldn't see a firewall. Maybe you do. Well, what's, uh, you know, a lot can happen in exponential time. Okay, so, what? Um, I don't know. Good question. I mean, we're going, to, we're going to talk about complexity aspects of ADS-CFD uh, later in this talk. I'm not sure how the firewall uh, uh, paradox specifically plays out in the ADS-CFD context. Okay. Well, I'm talking about the specific uh, proposal of uh, blasting the black hole with a ball of station irradiation outside of ADS, freezing the bulk and then Oh, well, okay. I mean, if, if you had the ability to sort of freeze the evolution of physics, you know, because, you know, you're doing everything in some simulation, then again, I have nothing to say against the possibility that maybe you can create a firewall. Okay? You know, but, but I think it is, it is certainly of interest even to just, uh, you know, uh, rule this out or sort of show why it's not going to happen in the ordinary astrophysical context. Okay? So, um, as I said, uh, Harlow and Hayden gave a reduction argument for why this decoding task should, be, uh, should take time exponential in the uh, size of the black hole, or its entropy. Uh, now, their original argument uh, worked by uh, uh, taking a complexity class called QSZK, Quantum Statistical Zero Knowledge, and sort of polynomial, giving a polynomial time reduction from that class into the, the HH problem. Okay, so uh, uh, in other words, they showed that if the uh, decoding task were easy, then this QSCK would collapse to BQP, the class of problems efficiently solvable using a quantum computer. Okay, now uh, QSCK, I'm not going to define it, but it includes problems uh, such as, you know, given a many-to-one function, uh, like, for example, uh, hash functions that uh, also play a central role in uh, modern cryptography, find any collision in the hash function, right? Find any two inputs of this function that map to the same output. Okay, like find any two messages with the same digital signature, for example. Okay, uh, now, um, uh, you know, the, uh, maybe the centerpiece of my PhD thesis, as it happens, was to give the first formal evidence that QSEK is not equal to BQP. Okay, uh, now, I couldn't prove that QSEK is different from BQP. I mean, that would have required proving P is not equal to P space. You know, I didn't do that. Okay, but uh, what, what I could do was to show that, you know, if you could only access your many-to-one function as a black box or as an oracle, let's say, then even a quantum algorithm would need to access that oracle an exponential number of times in order to find these collisions. Okay, so, you know, uh, so at least no quantum algorithm like the ones that we know is going to make QSEK equal to BQP. Okay, so, you know, so, so, so their assumption was reasonable. Okay, but as I promised you yesterday, I'm going to show you a, a more streamlined reduction uh, that avoids the use of my PhD thesis. Okay, in particular, uh, I'll, I'll base the hardness of HH on, you know, the existence of any injective one-way function that is hard to invert quantumly. Okay, but first, uh, um, a, a caveat, uh, the reduction will not produce anything like an astrophysically realistic black hole. I mean, you know, for one thing, I don't know the uh, laws of, you know, the complete laws of quantum gravity that would describe the uh, formation of the, the microstate of, of such a black hole. Uh, even if I did, I, I don't know that I could analyze that. Um, well, what we'll instead do is we'll sort of produce a very artificial black hole uh, or, you know, w with quotes, uh, that uh, encodes our hard computational problem. But, you know, that will show that the general task that HH were st was studying, you know, has no polynomial time uh, solution under our assumption. And uh, intuitively, 
I would say that we're, you know, we're actually, you know, by looking at this artificial situation, we're actually making things easier for Alice. Okay, that a, a realistic black hole, it seems to me that the decoding task would only be harder than it is in this artificial case, although I don't have a formal argument for that, and, and it would be interesting to try to give one. Okay, so what we do is we let f be some injective one-way function, mapping, say, n input bits to m output bits, okay? And then we consider this state, uh, psi RBH, of our, you know, uh, Hawking radiation and black hole. Okay, so uh, inside of the black hole, we've got a superposition over all two to the n possible strings of n bits, um, x, and then um, in uh, our B mode, uh, we have, uh, well, a single qubit, I said, you know, which could be either zero or one, okay? And, um, you know, so I've given away to you for free some classical correlation between B and uh, the R region, right? So the last qubit of R, you know, is zero if this is zero, and it's one if this is one, okay? But currently there's no, uh, we can't observe the entanglement between these two qubits. Why not, anyone? What prevents us from observing the entanglement between those two qubits? Yeah, uh, uh, this, you know, you could say this x here and this f of x here de is decohering the entanglement, you know, uh, 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 just turning it into classical correlation. Okay, so r is by, uh, a register of m plus one qubits. Okay, but, you know, uh, formally, uh, uh, entanglement is present between r and b. Okay, in fact, um, uh, you know, we, uh, in principle, we could uh, decode the entanglement by simply applying some unitary transformation that took, you know, every basis state of the form f of x comma 1 and mapped it to uh, the corresponding basis state x padded out with zeros comma 1, right? And, you know, if we did that, then, then this would align with this, and, uh, you know, the, and, and, you know, if you, you could observe a Bell inequality or, or whatever other signature of entanglement between uh, this qubit and this qubit, okay? Well, the trouble is uh, doing that would require us to invert f, right? You know, uh, invert our one-way function. Okay, but that's, that, that, you know, that, 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 that's just one special case. Uh, so, we, you know, we'd like to give a general argument that whatever we did to, uh, uh, unveil this entanglement would actually require us to be able to invert f, okay? So for the general argument, you know, so suppose that u is a unitary transformation acting on r that, uh, um, uh, that, 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 that uh, solves the hh problem, well then, uh, you know, by definition, this qubit here has to be set to zero, this one here has to be set to one, and if there's to be maximal entanglement, right, then this state uh, here has to be equal to this state there for every value of x. Otherwise, uh, by the monogamy of entanglement, you know, it would be preventing maximal entanglement. Yeah? Why couldn't you apply f to the first entry? Uh, oh, you could do that as well. But that would be just as hard by the argument that we gave yesterday. Right? Remember, yesterday we pointed out that if you want to map x to f of x while not leaving around any copy of, of x, then that is just as hard as to uh, invert f. Okay, good point. Yeah? Uh, well, you know, this is not, as I said, uh, as I warned you, this is not the result of a natural physical evolution, okay? We're just trying to argue that this general decoding task is hard. However, and importantly, this state, psi RBH, can easily be prepared by a polynomial size quantum circuit, you know, given our assumption that F itself is efficiently computable. Okay? I could leave that as an exercise for you, show how to construct that circuit, you know, assuming the ability to compute f. Okay? So this state is easy to prepare, you know, meaning you could imagine some laws of physics consistent with the uh, polynomial time church Turing thesis that would lead to such a state. Okay, so now what we can say is that if u solves the HH problem, then um, there must be some family of states, say phi sub x, 
you know, indexed by x, uh, such that u maps these basis states on the left to uh, phi sub x tensor 0, and it maps these basis states on the right, the f of x ones, to phi sub x tensor 1. OK, so now what we can do Uh, is let V and W be the m qubit unitary transformations that are induced by U, our m plus 1 qubit unitary transformation, by setting the last qubit of R to just be, by fixing it to be 0 or 1, respectively. Right? And because it leaves that last qubit invariant, these will be unitary transformations. We then have uh, that V uh, maps uh, x padded out with zeros to phi sub x, and W maps f of x to uh, phi sub x. Okay, but now if I were to take V dagger W and apply it to f of x. Well then, you know, just by uh, applying this, right, I, were, I would get V dagger uh, phi sub x, which is x padded out with zeros. Okay, so I have my efficient quantum circuit for inverting f. Okay, and then, you know, there's some technical work to say, you know, if we had only partial, uh, if, if our algorithm only partially unveiled entanglement, one can show that uh, it will invert f with some decent success probability and so forth. Okay, that's the, that's the basic argument. Okay, now uh, I won't have time to uh, show it to you, but uh, if, if you look at my uh, Barbados lecture notes, which should be linked to from the PITP website, uh, I also have uh, an improvement to this construction uh, where I show that even if you only wanted to uh, reveal classical correlation between R and B, okay, let alone entanglement, that would already require you to solve uh, to, to be able to invert an arbitrary injective one-way function using a quantum computer. Okay, uh, the proof of that fact uh, uses a fundamental result from classical cryptography, which is called the Goldreich-Levin theorem. Okay, which uh, basically says that given any one-way function, it is possible to identify, uh, uh, like act mapping x to f of x, it is possible to identify a single bit you know, or like a, a, you know, a, a, a single bit of information about x, such that if you had the general ability to learn that one bit, then you could actually invert the one-way function. Okay, this is called a hardcore bit, a hardcore predicate. Okay, using these hardcore predicates, one can show that, that even seeing classical correlation between the different Hawking quanta would be at least as hard as inverting one-way functions. Uh, now, I, I conjecture that, uh, that, that, that in fact, you know, to, in order to observe the Hawking radiation as being in anything other than the thermal state, you know, that uh, the semi-classical calculation tells you, or that, that, that Hawking tells you it's in, you know, just, just to see that it's in any state other than that one is already uh, as hard as inverting one-way functions. I haven't given a formal argument for that, and it would be interesting to do so. Okay, uh, now um, I can't, uh, yeah? So you're saying it, it doesn't really have to do with monogamy of entanglement? After no, no, 
No, no, it's just, I, I, I think that it's really just about, you know, uh, being able to observe that the Hawking radiation is in, you know, has, has any kind of correlations that, you know, go outside of the semi-classical picture. I feel like once you're able to do that, then in some sense the game is over. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so now I can't resist uh, telling you about uh, an open problem uh, that was told to me by John Preskill. Okay, so uh, Preskill asked me the following. Um, so she said, so fine, suppose we agree that decoding Hawking radiation takes exponential time. You know, Harlow and Hayden are, are right about that. Um, but is it, could it be possible to decode the Hawking radiation, let's say to create a firewall, uh, by some uh, sequence of operations that would take exponential time, but that would always leave your state the quantum state of the uh, black hole and the, and the Hawking radiation uh, uh, within the set of states that have polynomial circuit complexity. Okay, so that you know, at no point in this process would you have to pass through an exponentially complex state. Okay, so uh, uh, you know, I, I, I love this question. What, what I can say about it is that for the particular uh, uh, um, examples that, I you know, that we construct, to show the hardness of the Harlow Hayden problem. In these cases, uh, one can actually do what he asks. One can uh, 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 you know, solve the Harlow Hayden problem while, while never passing through any states that have more than polynomial circuit complexity. Okay? Uh, but in the general case of the problem, I have no idea how to do that. Okay, that, that's another open question that I love. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, if you want another exercise, show how to uh, answer Preskill's problem, you know, in, uh, in, in, a, in, 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 a, in this special case. Yeah, question. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, ag again, what is special about it is mostly just that you cannot access the H region. Okay? That you're trying to do this decoding acting on R only while you know, H is inaccessible to you. Okay, for, for a fundamental reason. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, in some sense, that enters in at a later stage of the AMP's uh, argument, right? We're just talking about the hardness of unveiling the classical correlation, which then, you know, combined with no drama as Alice crosses the horizon, would lead to the problem later. Uh, yes, as I said, we did, use, we did make a mild use of that because we just needed there to be entanglement between R and B. We also just could have assumed that, you know, outright. Okay. So, Let me mention to you uh, one last open problem about uh, Harlow Hayden decoding, uh, which is you know, may may maybe my favorite one, my personal favorite. Okay, suppose that I granted you that P was equal to P space. Just take as dramatic a collapse of traditional computational problems as you could possibly want. Would that make the Harlow Hayden problem easy? Okay, so I'm now asking the converse, right? You know, that, you know we, we, we've seen that if a traditional problem, like inverting one way functions, is hard, then Harlow Hayden is hard. Okay, I'm asking is there any converse result? Okay, so like what, what would it take in terms of, you know, uh, traditional computational problems to make uh, decoding Hawking radiation easy? And the truth is that I don't know. You know, even, even, even if I grant sort of, you know, as much thinking power as, as, you, as you could ask for, well, you still have to go out in the physical world and apply this unitary transformation, and I'm not sure exactly how you would do it. Uh, so, you know, um, I can put this question uh, into a more general context. Uh, yeah. I mean, I understand it's sort of a counterfactual. So, what if you 
the yeah. Rules of the, game in the rules of the game are can you can we prove an implication of this type? Okay. I mean, you know, one way to prove it would be to prove uh, p is not equal to p space, and that a falsehood would imply anything. Okay. Short of doing that, can you prove that this implication is true? Right. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, P space is everything you could do with a classical computer using a polynomial and an amount of memory or space. But yeah, possibly exponential time, because you can reuse that memory as often as you like. Uh -huh. And you know, P equals P space is a sort of you know, as big a question as P versus NP. Because right, we can't, you know, we seem equally unable to solve either of them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. But then if p is equal to p space, yeah. that would also mean that p equals NP? Because yes, yes. But the, the implication goes in the wrong direction. OK? What the previous argument showed that if one way functions are hard, then Harlow Hayden decoding is hard. OK? I'm asking about the converse. OK? So, OK, so uh, more than a decade ago, uh, Greg Cooperberg and I uh, asked a, a general question along these lines, which we called the unitary synthesis problem, you know, and which remains uh, wide open. OK, so, uh, so the, the setting is, um, you know, given a, a, a Boolean function, f, you know, say uh, mapping, you know, n bits to one bit, uh, you can always uh, define a quantum version of an oracle, call it u sub f, which will take basis states of the form x comma b, and which will map them to x comma b exclusive or with f of x. So, you know, b plus f of x mod 2, right? This is just a way to take an oracle and make it unitary. Okay, make it uh, reversible. Okay, and then we could consider a quantum circuit with what are called uh, F oracle gates. Okay, that is, I'll just imagine, you know, that we have a gate that just magically computes F for free, right? When, whenever we want to. This just costs us one, ga one gate. Okay, and this gives us a notion of quantum circuit complexity relative to F sort of relative to the oracle f. Okay? So we could now define, you know, for any unitary transformation u, we could define c to the f of u uh, to be the minimum size of any quantum circuit uh, c uh, uh, that applies u, where now c is allowed to use f oracle gates. Okay, so uh, you know, ordinary quantum circuit complexity is just a special case of this, where f is the all zero function, let's say, right? But you know, given any Boolean function, you can ask the question: What would have a small quantum circuit if we knew how to efficiently compute f? That's effectively what we're asking here. OK, so now here's the question that Cooperberg and I asked. Is it true that for every n qubit unitary transformation uh, uh, u, uh, there exists some Boolean function f such that uh, given an oracle for f, uh, u has polynomial in n circuit complexity? Okay. I'm asking, for every unitary, right, is there a Boolean function such that if you could compute it for free, then that u would be easy to apply, would have a small quantum circuit? OK. Um, I suspect probably the answer is no. But uh, I, uh, uh, you know, we, uh, we, we've, we've been able to make very little headway on this. Uh, uh, but notice, you know, if the answer were yes, 
then that would, that would suggest that some result of this type ought to be provable, right? That there is some f such that if we could efficiently compute it, then, you know, applying a unitary of our choice, such as the unitary that decodes the Hawking radiation, would then be easy. Okay, so uh, let me give you, just to uh, uh, check intuition, let me give as an exercise, uh, proof that for every quantum state uh, of n qubits, uh, there, there does exist a Boolean function f such that c to the f of psi is at most polynomial in n. And you can even try to optimize the, uh, that, that polynomial if you would like to. Okay, so in other words, this, you know, the answer to our question is affirmative for states, but we don't know if it's true for applying unitary transformations, which is, which is what would be relevant for Harlow Hayden. Okay, good? Yes? When you ask such a question, what do you mean by for every U? Uh, oh, yeah, good, good, good. Uh, good, okay, good, uh, thanks. So, 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 so what I mean is, um, you know, is it true that, uh, there, let's say there is a universal upper bound on the size of a circuit that would be needed, you know, which uh, is polynomial in n. So sort of is there, let's say for every infinite family of u's, you know, indexed by n, you know, is it the, huh? Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 not, I'm not demanding that there be a uniform way to describe it. So, you know, so I'm, so I'm, so I'm asking just is there a, uh, um, um, you know, uh, I, I, is there a way to take a unitary with n qubits and produce from it a Boolean function uh, uh, such that, you know, uh, we will then, uh, together with a circuit that uses that function to uh, apply you, such that, you know, overall, our pre you know, looking at our preparation procedure, we can give a universal polynomial in n upper bound on the size of the circuit that will be output. Okay, good. I, I, think, I, think, I think that's the right way to formalize it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Any other questions? Okay. So, Okay, so in um, the uh, uh, remaining uh, part of uh, the talk, let me uh, move on to uh, uh, talk about uh, the work that uh, Lenny Susskind and I did about uh, uh, the growth of complexity and of wormholes in uh, 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 situations like the, the thermofield double state, okay, or, or ADS-CFT. Okay. So, um, okay, so uh, Susskind, uh, uh, to give you the background, was interested in situations like the following. And again, I apologize for drawing a cartoon rather than a Penrose diagram. Uh, but uh, he was interested in uh, situations where you have two uh, uh, space-time regions in a bulk, uh, which are connected only via a wormhole, okay? And, uh, um, you know, this can be described in a classical GR, and, you know, what uh, tends to happen is just, you know, that the wormhole gets longer and longer as time passes, okay? And he was interested in looking at the CFT dual of, uh, of this situation. So uh, he was sort of uh, um, interested in looking at a, uh, a CFT state on some boundary of, of this space time that, uh, that, that uh, modeled what was going on in the bulk.
Uh, so um, we could say, uh, you know, when you look at the CFT dual, well, you get uh, 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 some initial state for this system, say along some uh, uh, spatial slice, uh, which uh, is a thermofield double state. Okay, so uh, you know it has amplitudes that uh, that, that decay and that, and that cause the, the, your state to look thermal if you were to look at only one of these uh, these, uh, these two regions and trace out the other region. Okay, but uh, I'm going to make the simplifying assumption that we actually just have maximal entanglement between the two regions, right? Uh, this this won't. Uh, won't materially affect what follows, right? I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll assume, you know, that our initial state is, let's say, just some, you know, some state of maximal entanglement between, uh, between two different regions. Okay, so uh, where let's say in, in each of them, uh, we could have all possible uh, strings Y of n bits. Okay, so we have a state that looks like this, okay? And, and of course, the fact that uh, we see entanglement in the CFT and a wormhole in the bulk is uh, an instance of this uh, famous uh, ER equals EPR uh, paradigm or, or, or conjecture. Okay, but now uh, Susskind was interested in what happens as the system undergoes time evolution. Okay, so... Uh, uh, what the time evolution will do in the bulk, uh, we already said, it will just tend to make the wormhole longer and longer. Uh, um, what, but if, if you look at the CFT dual, then uh, what happens is that, uh, well, this state, uh, uh, psi, undergoes some sort of messy, you know, Hamiltonian evolution, right? So there is some Hamiltonian uh, which acts on each of the two sides uh, separately, okay? Uh, so let's, let's call our Hamiltonian H, you know, and uh, it's, uh, we can think of it as just like a sum of terms, you know, maybe each of them acting on two qubits or, you know, on just a few qubits, although, you know, the precise form of the Hamiltonian won't be so important for us. Uh, you know, as long as it uh, will satisfy some conditions that we'll, that we'll talk about. Uh, and so then, you know, and uh, uh, um, interestingly, what happens in this thermofield double state is that the same Hamiltonian acts on each side, but sort of uh, in one of them you evolve forward and on the other side you evolve backward. Okay. So, uh, so after a time t, we get a state psi sub t that will look like superposition over all y's of um, e to the minus iht y tensor e to the iht y. Right? And now uh, let me just simplify this further. Uh, let me write uh, a sec. Um, U. Okay, so we, one thing we know is when you have a maximally entangled state, if you apply a unitary U to one half of it, that is the same thing as applying U transpose, right? Not U conjugate transpose, but U transpose to the other side. Okay, so so let's just define U uh, to be e to the minus iht uh, transpose times e to the iht, okay? Then this thing is just going to be equal to, uh, oh, sorry, uh, let's just uh, e to the ih. So we're setting t equals 1 here, okay? Then this is just superposition over all y's of y tensor u to the t y. Okay, this is not u dagger, u to the t. Okay, so, uh, so in other words, all that's happening, if you like, is that some unitary is getting applied over and over to one of the two halves of our maximally entangled state. Okay, and you know, and, and uh, you know, we don't know 
you know, any uh, great structure possessed by this unitary. We could think of it as just sort of scrambling things up. Okay. Um, so and and so so now um, we sort of face a puzzle. Okay. Uh, Lenny uh, likes to illustrate this puzzle by drawing a picture. So let's say that we plot the uh, volume of this wormhole as a function of, uh, of a time parameter t. You know, of course, we have to be careful in how we parameterize it. Okay, but uh, under some reasonable parameterization, what you find is that the volume simply increases linearly with time. Yeah. What? Excuse me. Yes. The, uh, I don't think so. I mean, I think you know there is real evolution that happens. Uh, the um, well, okay. I mean, I mean, uh, so so you know we are taking a transpose here. But yeah, we are taking a transpose there. That's important, right? So you know, so if um, like if if e to the i h were real, then this would just be the square of that, right? OK, so, um, uh, okay. So, so then what you find happens is that the wormhole volume, uh, you know, just, you know, increases linearly. You know, in classical GR, it would just continue to increase linearly forever. Uh, in quantum gravity, you know, you might imagine, well, that, well, eventually we just run out of dimensions of our Hilbert space. And so then uh, he conjectures that this volume will reach a maximum uh, uh, that is uh, exponential in, 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 in n, you know, in the number of qubits that, you're, that we're dealing with, sort of, you know, after we've exhausted the Hilbert space. And then it will just sort of stick around that maximum for a very long time. Now, eventually, if you were to wait a doubly exponentially long time, this is not to scale, uh, then, uh, you know, the system would undergo recurrences and, you know, the complexity could dip and become small again. But, you know, but that doesn't happen for a very, very long time. Okay, so now uh, uh, Lenny posed the following question. He asked, you know, what quantity uh, on the CFT side, you know, or what property of our state, psi sub t, could we possibly point to that would have this behavior? Right? If you know, the uh, bulk boundary correspondence is true, then there must be there must be some function say f of psi t, uh, that will, you know, capture the volume of this wormhole. Okay, but none of the sort of usual measures uh, uh, of quantum states seem to work here. If we looked, for example, at k-point correlation functions, or if we looked at the entropies of, you know, uh, reduced k-qubit density matrices, or anything like that, all of those things are going to generically saturate after a very short amount of time, after t is polynomial in, in n, probably just n log n or something like that, right? I mean, basically, as soon as scrambling is able to happen, right, as soon as sort of every qubit is able to influence every other qubit, then, you know, you get a sort of state that looks locally just like a maximally mixed state. And so then from the perspective of local observables, nothing interesting is happening anymore. Right? And that would, that would already be here, you know, 
you know, after po polynomial time. Okay, and yet in, uh, over in the bulk, the wormhole is just continuing to get longer for exponential time. Okay, so, uh, so he asks, you know, what property of a quantum state does this? And so his proposal was to take this quantity to be the circuit complexity of your state, psi sub t. That is the minimum number of gates that would be needed to prepare psi t, let's say, from the all zero initial state. Yeah? Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we're we're sort of imposing some cutoff so that you know we're dealing we're assuming that we can deal here with a finite number of qubits. If we can't do that, then we can't get started here. Uh, be, uh, well, okay. I mean, I mean, this is just a conjecture that he makes, you know, based on looking at, you know, assuming that that there is some underlying Hilbert space, you know, and its dimension is, let's say, two to the n or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, um, uh, so let's see. So, so um, circuit complexity, you know. Uh, uh, you know, intuitively seems like it would have this behavior, or, or it might anyway. Uh, and you know, the idea is that it would function as a sort of intrinsic clock. That is a pro just a static property of a quantum state. You know, that if you knew it, would sort of indicate how long that state has been evolving for. Right. That that's effectively what he, he wants to use circuit complexity for. Okay. Now you might object. Uh, well, why not just do something simpler and just you know, define your uh, f to be just whatever value of t solves the equation of you, know, you let the, your, you know, h evolve for that amount of time and then you produce psi sub t, right? That would be an even simpler measure. Well, the trouble with that measure is that it depends on h. Okay, and sort of you would like a property that is intrinsic to your state. You know, and not depending on knowledge of the Hamiltonian that was used to uh, produce that state. Okay. Um, now, um, um, another objection uh, that might be raised is that the circuit complexity of a state is not an observable, right? There is no measurement that you can do on one copy of a quantum state that will tell you what its circuit complexity is. You know, I'll leave the proof of that as an exercise. Okay, for uh, the, the, those who are interested, but you know, uh, certainly, you know, just like entropy is not an observable, right? Uh, complexity is not an observable either. Okay, so let's say, you know, so, so then, so then, how could it be dual to a wormhole, or how could it be encoding wormhole volume? Okay, but then uh, Lenny uh, points out that well, wormhole volume is not obs an observable either. <laughs> okay, why? Because uh, this wormhole is non-traversable. Right. So as uh, Edward uh, uh, pointed out, or you know, showed in in uh, in, in in his talk, right, there is this uh, under some energy condition at least we have topological censorship, right, uh, which means you know you you can't uh, uh, Alice cannot enter one mouth of this wormhole and exit the other mouth in order to measure how long it was. Okay, now it is possible that if Alice jumped into one mouth of the wormhole and Bob jumped into the other mouth, they could meet in the middle. But then whatever happened would kind of, you know, just like with Vegas, right? It would, it would, it would, it would, it would, it would stay with them, right? And so then, you know, you would, you would, you would not get an observable that could be seen by someone at, at, at infinity. Okay, so. Uh, so, so, so maybe it's okay to, you know, uh, relate one non-observable to another non-observable. Okay. Um, okay. But now, uh, okay. And 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 this proposal, you know, I mean, it, you know, it seemed, uh, you know, a little uh, uh, audacious to me, but it actually passed some non-trivial tests, 
which I won't have time to go into, but in work by uh, uh, um, Lenny and by Douglas Stanford, uh, they, did, they considered more complicated situations than the one that I described, involving things, sending things called shock waves into the wormhole. And they showed that circuit complexity see, you know, of, of your state seems to continue to track you know, uh, the volume of the wormhole, even in these more complicated cases, you know, at least heuristically. But, you know, but it does so uh, quite well. So, yeah. Uh, yes. So yeah, I'm not saying that this is easy to compute, and, and we're going to come to that later. How can we actually know that the complexity is large? That, of course, is going to be our, our central question. Yeah. Uh, I miss, how did they know that the volume of the wormhole grows linearly after? That's some GR thing. So I, you know, I'm again, I'm just, I'm just a consultant. Okay, I leave, I leave that to you. Do the, do the GR, and uh, yeah. All right, good. So now, Uh, so now, you know, here is the question as uh, Lenny presented it to me, okay? It is clear that the circuit complexity of psi sub t is going to be upper bounded well, certainly, you know, by t times a polynomial in n. Why? Because we could simply create a quantum circuit that recapitulates the obvious, you know, Hamiltonian evolution that, you know, uh, by definition, you know, created this state from a simple initial state, right? Uh, there's a trick for simulating Hamiltonians using discrete sets of gates called trotterization, you know, and you you, you simply need to uh, apply that trick here to uh, discretize your your continuous time Hamiltonians. Okay, and you know, well, at, uh, um, um, at any rate, you could do this to a very high precision. Okay, so and and then also certainly c sub psi t will be upper bounded by two to the n times a polynomial in n because the circuit complexity of every n qubit state is so upper bounded. Okay, so certainly this picture is a ceiling on the circuit complexity. Okay, but uh, Lenny's question was, well, can we prove that it is a floor, right? So how do we know uh, that there are no uh, remarkable shortcuts, you know, that a circuit could take that would avoid the need to recapitulate the full time evolution of the Hamiltonian? Uh, so why couldn't the circuit complexity just, you know, flatline like this, for example? Uh, yeah. Uh, that you run out of Hilbert space. Okay. Again, that, that you don't see that in classical GR. The conjecture is that that happens in quantum gravity. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Well, well, well. Circuit complexity is computational cost. They mean the same thing. No, but if, if you were just doing nothing, then I would just cut all of those gates out and get a smaller circuit that did the same thing. Okay, computational cost means the size of the smallest circuit that produces the state that we're interested in. Okay, and you know, and this is a difficulty, right? Because you know, usually, you know, in, in physics, one wouldn't talk about you know global minimization, certainly over you know such enormous spaces, right? Uh, you know, you could wonder how does nature know, you know, uh, uh, what is the smallest circuit, right? Uh, if it turned out that you know that there that, that the circuit complexity was polynomial rather than exponential because of some you know clever algorithm that someone will discover well would that imply that the wormhole in the bulk would suddenly be much shorter right well, how you know well, why does the wormhole know or care about that algorithm 
Okay? I mean, I think those are excellent questions. They're certainly questions that I've posed to Lenny many times. Uh, and you know, my guess would be that circuit complexity is functioning here as a proxy for something more fundamental that is not yet known. Okay? But uh, 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 you know, the fact remains that I cannot come up with a better proxy. Okay? So you know, if any of you can, then uh, that's the, uh, that would be great. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, okay, good. That, that's exactly what I'm now coming to. Why does, you know, do, will the complexity actually behave like this or not? That is now the question that Lanny posed to me. Okay? So, what, so, so, so what could we say? About, okay, and, you know, he said, um, 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 uh, yeah, you know, he, he said, look, you know, uh, you know, there should be a theorem here, but, you know, I don't prove theorems, so you prove it. <laughs> and uh, uh, his, uh, his words. And uh, I said, well, look, uh, when, um, if, 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 t, if, if you allow t to become doubly exponential in n, then uh, you know, this uh, Hamiltonian evolution by then you know, will have generically explored such a large region of the Hilbert space that just by a counting argument, it will surely pass through states that have exponentially large circuit complexity. That's another exercise. Okay, I invite you to prove that, right? That if you let it evolve for a double exponential amount of time, then just for counting reasons, you're going to hit states. You know, in fact, most states that you hit will have uh, exponential circuit complexity. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's say for a yeah. Let's say for a generic choice of h. Yeah. You know, for some H, yeah, satisfying some, some genericity assumption. I think if we just chose it as a sum of local terms, you know, that were random, I think this, this should be true with high probability. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll uh, actually, you know, I haven't, I haven't checked it in that case, but, uh, but I, uh, I, I uh, um, well, uh, let's say I, I, I conjecture it. I, I invite you to prove that conjecture. <laughs> okay? Uh, so, Okay, but, but in any case, what Lenny was interested in was what happens after a merely exponential time. Okay, and there, uh, you know, we could make uh, a simple observation. And uh, this uh, um, I'll give as another exercise, though it's closely related to an exercise from yesterday. Okay, I invite you to check that if BQP were equal to P space, that is, if quantum computers could efficiently solve all problems you know, solvable using a polynomial amount of memory, you know, then for all times up to exponential in n, the circuit complexity of this state would remain only polynomial in n. Okay, so in other words, in asking me to prove uh, um, that the circuit complexity, you know, becomes exponential, or even just that it becomes more than polynomial, you know, Lenny was effectively asking me to prove p is not equal to p space. Okay, so I said, look, my consulting rate for that is higher. <laughs> okay, uh, so he said, okay, fine. Well, then just assume whatever you want to assume about complexity classes. And then can you prove you know, the, the diagram that I want under, under those assumptions? And I said, now we're cooking. Okay? So, Sorry? Uh, yeah, it should be bounded from above. Yeah, 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 right, right. I'm saying this is an obstruction to showing the lower bound that we would like to show. Right, we want to show that the circuit complexity becomes super polynomial, but if BQP were equal to P space, then we can't. Okay, then, then it just wouldn't be true. Okay, so.
so let me give you an informal statement of the uh, theorem that one can prove here, slightly informal. Okay, so we're going to need some assumption on our unitary u, you know, e to the minus ih that gets applied over and over to uh, half of our entangled state. So, and my assumption is basically going to be that u can be used to implement one step of a universal computer. Okay? Or in other words, if you like, I will be assuming that the laws of physics describing the CFT, you know, whatever they are, are laws that are capable of universal computation. Okay? Now, you know, I, I, um, um, that may seem strange, but I think it's actually a very reasonable assumption. After all, you know, uh, it, clearly it is true of our laws of physics, right? And, uh, you know, and um, we, we, you know, it's sort of, you know, uh, it's been found to be true for sort of any sufficiently complicated laws of physics, right? There is sort of a threshold of computational universality that, you know, once your laws reach a certain level of complexity, then it becomes able to construct special states, you know, of your system that will behave as a universal computer. Basically just do a desired sequence of and or and not gates. Okay, so, that, that, so that's what I'm asking for here. So let's say, let you implement a step uh, of, you know, to, to be more concrete, uh, let's just say a computationally universal cellular automaton of some kind. Okay, it's, it can be a classical cellular automaton. I won't even need quantum computation here. Uh, you know, it, it will be uh, reversible just because uh, it's unitary. Oh, oh no, we'll only need you. And then all of the computation that we do will be sort of sh shoehorned into the, uh, some part of the initial state, if you like. Yeah, and then, and then u is just fixed, right? It's just anything capable of universal computation. And then the left will, you know, uh, uh, um, everything else will be left to, to the initial state. Okay, uh, yeah. okay thanks. So um, then, um, then the circuit complexity of psi sub t will become more than a polynomial in N for some time t, uh, uh, which is uh, merely exponential in N. So b is here some constant, uh, uh, say, you know, between 1 and 2. Um, um, unless p space is contained in pp slash poly, okay? So unless these uh, complexity classes that I showed before sort of suffer a collapse that is uh, believed to be very unlikely, okay? So grant a reasonable complexity con hypothesis let your uh, CFT Hamiltonian be capable of universal computation. Have it apply to an initially entangled state, or let's say the thermofield double state. And then you will generate super polynomial circuit complexity within merely exponential time. OK, now, now of course, that's, that's not as strong as what Lenny asked for, right? He wanted linear growth here. OK, so what can we say about that? Well, you know, it's, it's often the case that, you know, with a stronger assumption, you can get a stronger conclusion, right? So if you will, um, if you're willing to assume that, let's say, there are problems solvable in linear space that uh, require exponential time to solve by any PP al algorithm or PP circuit, then, uh, we can get that actually the circuit complexity uh, becomes exponential uh, uh, within an exponential time. Okay, uh, you know, at least it becomes at least a to the n for some constant a greater than one. Okay, uh, now so so in other words, it grows at least like t to the epsilon. You know, for some epsilon bounded above zero. Now, does it grow liter literally linearly with t? Well, I don't, you know, I mean, quite plausibly, yes. 
But I don't know how to prove that using a reduction-based hardness argument, okay, because of sort of the blow-up that gets produced by the reduction, or if you like, the blow-up that is uh, 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 incurred by sort of needing to take a universal computer and shoehorn it into whatever your laws of physics are. Okay, so, uh, you know, if you, uh, well, in, in any case, it's linear growth if you plot it on a log-log plot, okay? Uh, you know, for, uh, um, uh, to get, you know, you know, truly linear growth, you might have to stick your neck out and make a, a, a new type of hardness assumption. Okay, so, yeah. Yes. That, well, yeah, I'm, I'm saying that if, uh, sorry, uh, if, sorry, let me, let me say it more carefully. If there are problems solvable in linear space that require exponential size PP circuits, okay, so we replace this assumption by this stronger one, then if within an exponential time, the circuit complexity becomes exponential in N. Okay. Uh. Okay, so uh, proof. Okay, first of all, um, it is known that a uh, reversible cellular automaton, you know, uh, is able to take, you know, any uh, problem that is solvable, uh, you know, with a, say, a polynomial amount of space, you know, any p-space problem, and you can solve that problem even with a reversible uh, uh, mach machine. And you know, making the computation reversible incurs only a constant factor blow up in the amount of space that is needed. This is a result from uh, Lange, McKenzie, and Tapp from 1996, which I'll, I'll just uh, assume, okay? Uh, so now, what we'll do is we'll suppose uh, by contradiction that the circuit complexity of psi sub t never becomes more than polynomial uh, for you know for all uh, when when t is less than two to the n. Okay. Now we let L be some decision problem that's solvable in polynomial space. Okay, and then then given an input x, you know, to our p-space problem, we will show how to decide the answer to x. That is, is x in the set L or is it not in the set L? Right. We'll show how to, you know, solve L on the input x um, in. in this complexity class. So using a quantum algorithm that runs in polynomial time that can be non-uniform, you know, can uh, be different for each input length, and which is allowed to post-select on measurement outcomes. Okay, now, by the theorem that I proved in 2004, and which I mentioned uh, yesterday, this class is known to be equal to PP slash poly. Okay, and then we will have violated our starting hypothesis. Okay, and the way we do this is actually uh, quite simple. Okay, so what will our algorithm do? Our post-selected polynomial time non-uniform quantum algorithm. Well, first of all, the um, so-called advice to the quantum algorithm, that is the part of it that depends on, our, on the length n of our input, will simply be a description of uh, a circuit C uh, that, um, that prepares psi sub t for t uh, equal to some uh, b to the n, which let's say is a long enough time 
for our, you know, for a peace space machine to have run for a while and then have decided whether or not X is in L, right? So, you know, we just, you know, we'll, we'll assume, you know, but by assumption, right, there is some P space machine to solve the problem L. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, we can actually, um, um, well, you know, we, we, uh, 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 for, for um, uh, we, we can assume for simplicity that, uh, let's say it's a, a, a linear space. Okay, you know, the case of general polynomial space will be uh, uh, similar. And so then if it's linear space, then the algorithm halts after at most an exponential and n number of steps and returns an answer. Let's say it's b to the n steps. Then set t to be that b to the n. Then by our assumption, uh, this state of our CFT after b to the n time has some small circuit to prepare it. So we give that uh, description of that circuit as uh, we, we sort of hard code it into uh, the specification of our algorithm. OK, then what does the algorithm do? Well, as a first step, it prepares the CFT state. So it uses this presumed ability coming from the small circuit to take a shortcut through time you know, and prepare the state of the CFT after exponential time using only a polynomial size circuit. Okay, and that gives it the state like superposition over all n bit strings y of y tensor uh, u to the t y, right? Okay, next our algorithm will measure this first register just in the computational 0, 1 basis and it will post select using its post selection power on just happening to observe an outcome uh, where y is found to be equal to s sub x, where s sub x is the uh, initial state of, uh, uh, of, of some, you know, uh, you know is, 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 a, is an initial state of our cellular automaton that sets it working doing a p-space computation for expo an exponential amount of time that will terminate after b to the n steps with deciding uh, the answer, whether x is in L or not. Okay, so now, you know, if assuming that we get this out, that outcome, S sub x in the first register, which we can assume by post selection, then what we'll see in the second, reg when we measure the second register, is just u sub t, u to the t, S sub x, which by assumption encodes the answer to our p space problem. Okay, uh, therefore, um, And therefore, we solve uh, L, which could have been any problem in P space, in uh, this class PP slash poly. Okay, and that's, that, uh, uh, that's it. Okay, now, um, let me mention, clearly we needed some condition on the unitary U to prove a theorem of this kind. If, for example, U were the identity, <laughs> Transformation. Well, then it's never going to produce any complexity, right? So, um, uh, so you know, uh, some uh, physicists who I talked to speculated that the relevant property of U was going to be some sort of chaotic or some sort of quantum chaos behavior or some sort of scrambling. Uh, but uh, uh, so we we instead use the related condition of being computationally universal. Um, you know, I don't, you know, to you know, elucidate the connection between you being chaotic and you being computationally universal, I think is a, would be a very interesting direction to pursue. Okay, uh, let me mention um, briefly that, you know, one can also consider Uh, a notion uh, that uh, uh, I call the separable complexity of the state psi sub t. And this is just uh, the minimum size of any quantum circuit to prepare psi sub t, uh, where, but where we disallow gates that straddle the boundary between the two uh, entangled halves. Okay, so in other words, uh, no gates crossing the wormhole are allowed. 
Okay. You know, which, I don't know, seems reasonable to me. Okay. And, um, you know, I don't know whether this would be uh, a better quantity to look at. I mean, you know, it seems to uh, behave similarly to the uh, ordinary circuit complexity, you know, in uh, Susskind's example, at least, you know, for the thermofield double state. Uh, but um, but what, what we can say about its complexity is actually quite different. Um, so, uh, um, it turns out that in this case, one can prove that the separable complexity of the state, psi sub t, is equal to the circuit complexity of the unitary transformation, u to the t. OK? So, so, and so in this case, uh, we actually, you know, we know that there is no, one can show that there is no way to prepare the state by a separable circuit other than by applying the unitary. OK, I'll leave that as an exercise if you'd like to prove that. I'll give you a hint. There's something in quantum information called the choi jam yukowski isomorphism. So use that. Okay. All right. So, um, so in particular, uh, one thing that this means is that uh, the, um, this separable circuit complexity uh, will be upper bounded by a polynomial in N you know, for all uh, uh, times up to exponential, if and only if uh, p space is contained in BQP slash poly. So, you know, p space, every problem in p space has an efficient quantum algorithm. Okay, so two differences. Here, you know, we no longer need post selection as we did in the. Uh, for the non-separable circuit complexity. And also, in this case, we get an if and only if, okay, which I don't know how to do in the other case. Okay, uh, that, uh, that's another interesting question. Okay, yeah, what? Yes, this is proven. Uh, yeah, I, I'll give it as another exercise. Yeah. Is the algorithm Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it's very, I mean, you know, this is a very, very simple proof. It fit on one board, but yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, this is, this is, yeah. Yes. Yes, you, yes, you post select. Okay. All right. So um, I had one final uh, uh, vignette, which, you know, I'll, I'll only have, you know, I only have a couple of minutes to uh, tell you the gist of it. But uh, basically, you know, so, so Lenny had, uh, you know, another consulting job for me where, you know, he was uh, interested, well, in situations where you have, sort of macroscopic superposition. So, you know, he was interested in particular in taking a superposition of two different uh, space-time geometries, or rather the, uh, like the CFT duals of sort of two different uh, 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 geometries, you know, in, in the bulk. And he was interested in the question, when are the geometries sort of so different from each other uh, that, you know, a, having a superposition between the two is uh, uh, indistinguishable by any experiment that you could actually perform from just having an incoherent mixture, right? Uh, from, from just having a probabilistic mixture of the two things. Okay, so, you know, he was asking this in, uh, you know, uh, the ADS-CFT context, but one could just as well have asked this question about, you know, the much earlier example of, say, Schrodinger's cat, right? Uh, you know, if I have a, a cat in a, a superposition of alive and dead states, well, you know, intuitively, you might say, the only way that I'm, I could ever observe sort of the interference fringes between alive and dead, and thereby prove it was in the superposition at all, would be if I had the technological ability to bring a dead cat back to life, right? You know, sort of to rotate the cat between these two uh, vectors in Hilbert space, right? But uh, the question he asked was, well, is that actually true? Right? Or could there be some other clever way where you would observe interference you know, without needing to actually rotate between the two states? Okay, so Lenny's insight was that this question could be phrased as a question about quantum circuit complexity. Right? Namely, you know, how does the circuit complexity of the distinguishing task, say distinguishing the superposition from the mixture, relate to the circuit complexity of mapping 
the one basis state to the other one. Okay, so again, he said, well, you know, I don't prove things, so you prove this. And uh, so indeed, it turns out that these two circuit complexities can be shown to be related within a factor of two. Okay, I'll leave that as uh, uh, maybe a last exercise. Okay, if you'd like to show that. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's not hard, right? It's, I mean, once you know to ask the question, right? It's a you know, very simple simulation, except that you know, there, there's one caveat to it, okay? You know, you could show that like any type of amount of distinguishability implies some amount of mapping ability of, you know, uh, necromancy, I guess dead to alive, you know, uh, alive to dead is not really necromancy, but, uh, um, uh, conversely, any amount of mapping ability implies some distinguishing ability, unless there's one exception. If you had a unitary transformation that mapped alive to dead while mapping dead to minus alive, okay, so if the relative phase were minus one, then I don't know that that implies any distinguishing ability. Okay, in every other case it does. Uh, uh, now, is there any uh, in, you know, example where that minus one phase would actually show up in real life? I don't know. Okay, that is another open question. Okay, but, uh, but you know, except for that, right, I mean, I mean you know, and, and, and one can certainly show the other direction. One can show that ability to detect, you know, a macroscopic superposition between two things always implies sort of with the same sort of technological resources the ability to map the one thing to the other. Okay, so uh, the implications of this result, first of all, if we combine with the earlier result, the one that I just showed you here, then it means that, you know, if, you know, as long as you believe that P space is not in PP slash poly or whatever, then, uh, you know, if, if we took like a superposition over a really short wormhole and a really long wormhole, right, like a, you know, polynomially short and exponentially long, then you're never going to see the interference between the two, okay, not by any experiment that could be performed in polynomial time, right, you might as well just say at that point that it's an incoherent mixture you know, with respect to any efficient experiment, okay? And the second implication is that the Schrodinger's cat experiment involves far less animal cruelty than is commonly supposed, okay? If you can do it at all, then the cat is never permanently dead. Just rotate it back to life, all right? And again, it is circuit complexity that lets you articulate such a statement. So thanks for your attention. <laughs>